A bit lit, celebrating research and creativity of all kinds. Hi, Richard. Hi, Callan. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, really looking forward to hearing um, about your practice and about your new poetry collection, The Dolphin House, um, amongst other things. We have been starting these videos by asking contributors to um, introduce themselves and say a little bit about what it is that they do. So maybe I can hand over to you to do that. Yeah, so I'm Richard O'Brien. I'm a lecturer in creative writing at Northumbria University at Newcastle in the UK. And uh, I'm a poet, and you'll know this, Callum, because we started off our careers writing poetry uh, together when we were about 16. Um, but I, I did a PhD that was kind of um, mostly in early modern literature, but with some elements of um, creative work. And, and, and now I teach um, across all genres, really, but creative writing up here. Mm -hmm. And so, and you've recently um, brought out uh, this collection, The Dolphin House, um, which is, I guess is one of the reasons why, why we're talking today. Um, and I wondered if you could give uh, a sort of an introduction really to, to what the poetry collection is about and where it came from, why you wanted to write about it. Yeah, sure. So it's um, it's a sort of narrative collection uh, that, that tells the story uh, through a series of individual poems of a scientific experiment which took place in 1965, um, where um, a woman called Margaret Howe lived in a semi-flooded apartment in the Virgin Islands uh, with a dolphin called Peter and tried to teach it to speak English. Uh, and this was happening under the auspices of a guy called John Lilly, who is a figure I just became completely fascinated with uh, as one of these absolutely bizarre sort of long 20th century lives. So he started off as a kind of MIT trained um, neuroscientist, I believe. Uh, he invented the flotation tank. He got extremely heavily into psychedelics and uh, essentially his research, which was about the intelligence and language capabilities to dolphins drifted further and further away from the scientific mainstream until um, by the end of his life, he was really considered quite a kind of crackpot fringe figure uh, because he kept talking about being spoken to by alien presences while in the tank on LSD. Um, but the, the the reason I kind of first got into this, uh, and it's the place I get a, quite a lot of my ideas, to be honest, is from a podcast. There was a, an episode of the podcast Radio Lab um, called Hello. And uh, there was a, a segment on that by a producer called Lynn Levy, where she interviewed Margaret Howe about her experiences of living with the dolphin, which is the first I ever heard of it. Uh, since I looked into it, it turns out quite a few other people have um, written their own creative treatments of the story. Um, but um, or there are some creative treatments of the story and some documentary treatments of it, I suppose. Uh, but I just really wanted to, to sort of tell, I guess, the kind of tell this story in its wider context um, because it can be reduced to some of the more sensational things that happens. And I, I'm absolutely sure we'll get into those, but uh, that kind of diverts the focus from the fact that it was fundamentally very, very strange for a woman to live in a flooded apartment with a dolphin and that it was all in the context really of the sort of the, the cold war, the space race, all of these reasons that people were sort of starting to think about communication between, you know, powers and species differently in in the 60s and um and some of the sort of strange undercurrents that that bubbled to the surface there so this is a poem that kind of introduces the character of john Lilly, who who as i've said is this kind of straight-laced scientist who goes completely off the deep end and this is the first encounter margaret has with him a lot of this is kind of imagined uh, but i wouldn't be surprised if this is kind of what it was like to talk to the guy you and me in the incredibly distant island universes the man behind the glass removes his gloves. The man without his gloves glittered in salt, flips up his goggle glasses, and he looks like a woodsman training as a legal clerk, tucked tightly in his suit, savage and tall. His pockets brim with pens, his notes are damp. He cracks the door. You want to speak to me? When John drinks coffee, and he does drink coffee, it's squid ink black and his jitters justified. That's how we do it in St. Paul, he says, but tell me about you. I tried. I tried to hold my threadbare quilt of life, some college and a few hostessing shifts up to him and he burnt through and charged on. He told me that he was a journalist. No, that's not right, he said, a generalist, which seemed concerned with keeping people sane, although of course, he said, so few of us are. Stubs in the ashtray, gray mulch in the cup. 
If you could see into my soul, John said, assuming that you think the soul exists, what would you see? I didn't know. He told me, and it was a litany, the miles from Como to Cathedral Hill, the baseball stats for 1934, the fields of science and psychology all overlapping like a magic eye, the words of Christ, of Huxley and Karl Marx, and how it felt to drive a well-built car, guide in your hand a finely made machine, genetics as a branch of moral law and fucking as epistemology. He used that word, epistemology. Asked me to wait for him to finish work. I hold the joint like a laser scanning the surface of the moon. John bathes in thought while I just slowly pulse. And what he says is, Margaret, your mind, with all its files and drawers, all its dark rot, has barely opened up into itself. You're still so young. I like it that you're young. But how? And tell me this. How can we hope to know, to truly know the dolphin's mind, when all we understand about ourselves is echoes, ego, a rat stuck in a tube, never suspecting life whirls on outside? When we so feebly sound our own still depths, how can we reach another consciousness? The mirror in the car is all his eyes. I didn't know. I said I didn't know. Oh, wonderful, thank you. Mm. I mean, all of these themes, they're, they're, they're sort of, um, yeah, as you said, they're kind of running themes in the different poems in, in, the, um, in the collection. And whilst it's not, I guess it's not a linear narrative necessarily, um, there, there is a kind of story that you're telling throughout the collection via the different voices, the different means of communication. Um, I mean, how did you, yeah, how did you want to kind of tell, the, tell that narrative without doing it? I know it's been told in other forms, for instance, like films. So how did you want to do that um, through poetry? Yeah, I mean, it is actually reasonably chronological in terms of the actual sequence of poems in the book. That's not how they were written. Uh, they, uh, the first poem written in here was um, um, I Seldom Had Visitors, as it's now known. I, I could read it if that would be helpful as a way into it. Yeah, so this, this was originally the first half of the first poem written for the collection. Um, and you'll hear that uh, there's already quite a lot of stuff in this. And um, the feedback that I got when I brought this to a creative writing group in Birmingham was very much, feels like you get a couple more poems out of this, just kind of space that information out a bit more. And it ended up being, you know, a 45 page pamphlet. Um, but this is where it started. Um, I seldom had visitors. The doorbell never rings. I still anticipate the TV sitcom Bait and Switch, the postboy's shark as Peter concertinas through the water to the door, rotates the handle with his bottlenose and nabs the letter in his mouth, delivering a suave Midwestern thanks. And I descend, still fresh from six weeks in a Lurex bathing suit, to wait for his reply. I see the postboy see the desk that hovers with its laminated paperwork like the chrome cloud of an indifferent god. The hair I shave to bring us closer, tufting out my black lips like a faded mime. And I see Peter halfway human now, his eyes above the water, sitting on his nose, easy as spectacles. Oh no, he says, it's no trouble at all, craning to sign the pen between his teeth. I'm by his side, a painting of two homesteaders leaning on leaf nets as if they were farming tools. A ball bobs in the background childishly, but we have put such things away. I ask him where he'd like our new delivery. We watch the postboy stagger fish-legged down the street, his mouth a gasping blowhole. So as I said, I brought that to a poetry workshopping group that was meeting in the, uh, the John Lewis in Birmingham's Grand Central uh, shopping arcade that John Lewis has already closed. Uh, but at the time it had some space for, for some writers to meet. And um, basically the, the suggestion was just, there was a lot more of that story to explore. And also the people were kind of interested in the sort of specific textures of the world. There was someone else in the group, Jonathan Davidson, who suggested talking about Lurex, for example. And in terms of telling telling the story differently to previous uh, versions, um, I just I didn't really want to be completely sensationalist. I really wanted to get inside the psychology of well, why would you want to talk to a dolphin? Why would you think a dolphin could respond to you in English? And what what kind of meaningful connection did you did you expect to have with this creature? Or really, if, if there wasn't going to be a meaningful connection, what were you looking for from that process instead? I'm not sure the collection gets to the answers for any of these questions, but I thought they were interesting to kind of kick around 
And I really wanted to get into, you know, what was it actually like for Margaret herself to live here in this really strange environment and experience something kind of on her own. It was a very, clearly a very isolating experience, even though she was there with Peter. John Lilly himself calls it a study in dyadic isolation, which is a phrase that's made it into the book and which um, feels very sort of lockdown appropriate. Um, but yeah, just, just to think about, well, what was it actually like to live through this? And especially the, you know, the effects on her kind of mental state of doing something so extreme, rather than just focusing on the kind of um, the lurid aspects of what happened between them. Because you do, you, you, you kind of get these, as you say, it's a kind of a journey and it's, it's sort of chronologically arranged in the collection. And so you do get the, the, this sense of Margaret's interior responses to, from the very beginning, as she's setting out on, on this project to, to try to communicate with dolphins to the, the point um, in the collection where you, the poem you've just read. Um, and there's a kind of intimacy that develops between Margaret and the dolphin and Peter, the, Peter, the, the dolphin, the name of the dolphin becomes you know, he's one of the voices in the collection, I suppose it's fair to say. Um, yeah. His presence is there. Yeah, I mean, I suppose for most of it, his presence is there as a sort of, um, well, I mean, it is submerged. I mean, he, he's there, he's he's trying, to, he's communicating in his own way, I suppose, is what's happening, while, while Margaret and John are trying to force him to communicate in their way, and they're, they're, they're trying to teach him, essentially, language through a series of sort of schoolroom exercises about saying the names of, of shapes and counting to three and things that are all you know completely alien to a dolphin's uh you know worldview in various ways there's only one poem in the book which is actually spoken directly by peter and that's it's a sort of fantasy in a way that he is able to, to speak this poem but it's one of the first things i wrote and i did go back and forth about using it because everything else was focalized from margaret's perspective but because it's so much about what Peter would say if he could speak to the scientists. I thought I would at least create a space there for something like Peter's voice or what I might imagine Peter's voice would be like, especially in as much as that's somewhat different from what John and Margaret seem to want him to do. Yes, yeah. Yes, because I feel, you know, that there's the agency of the dolphin, for me, certainly kind of came through. And, and it's, you know, I'm not going to give anything away about the story for people who might come at it afresh, but... Um, you know, I found it extremely kind of emotionally engaging. And I was saying to you just before we came on, I mean, I've read this several times and I, I really got lost in, in that world. So I'm glad that someone said to you in, in John Lewis, you know, like write more of it and kind of build this, um, build, build this world about what it might be like to be trapped with, with a dolphin and to live with a dolphin um, for that long. Uh, yeah, so I, I found it kind of really absorbing and, and I felt like I had an attachment to, to Peter as well, um, reading through it. I, I wonder if you might say, uh, something about, I mean, you've kind of intimated a little bit about how you came to this through, through the podcast, but how, how do you go about researching something like this? And I guess ventriloquizing in a way, experiences that are real and that did happen, um, but that you're also imagining for yourself? Yeah, it's a, there's a lot of ethical questions it raises, I think, and the experiment itself, I mean, raised a lot of ethical questions about who speaks for whom and why. So I was very conscious of that when embarking on this project, that I am inhabiting the voice of a real person, a real person who's actually still alive. Um, I think she's in her late 80s. And the thing is, you know, the story has been told so many times that I didn't feel like I was crossing a line just by doing it. And, and I did want to just give her a bit more respect as, as an individual. And I think some of these, these tellings have done. Um, I mean, a lot of it is her own words or John's own words. Um, the, the main book that was my source, uh, I have it here, is um, The Mind of the Dolphin by John Lilly. You can see from the cover, um, which is Margaret in her black uh, leotard hanging out with the dolphin and absolutely beaming, just the kind of intimacy between them. Um, and so that's John's, uh, John Lilly's account of his experiments, but also contains Margaret's actual lab notes, essentially. And Margaret didn't come into this as a, as a trained scientist, but she clearly developed on the job, uh, uh, you know, a lot of kind of specialist knowledge. And, and so she writes about her, her experiences in, in the first person. And so I'm lifting some of that language, some of Lilly his language um and then yeah then i also just looked at the other documentaries that were out there there's one by christopher riley called the girl who talked to dolphins i think um i wanted to see a play on the same story by breach theater called tank and at first i was furious because i thought oh no they've done it they've already done it and it's better than what i'm doing but you know it's theater it's it's, it's externalized it's not exploring the kind of inner states in the same way i think is the mm -hmm. conclusion that i came to um so yeah basically i just looked at what everyone else had done 
tried not to do exactly the same thing and, and, and just thought about, well, what, what could I focus on that, that was kind of most meaningful to me there? And then some of the background research, I, I also read a great book by, or a, at least a chapter of the book, I, I should say, by Susan Casey um, from a book called Voices in the Ocean, which, which looked at kind of Lily's experiments in a wider context and obviously tells you things about Lily that he himself might not tell in terms of some of the, the darker sides of what happened. He killed dolphins for uh, getting into this, uh, you know, not for fun, but for dubious scientific uh, justifications. Um, so putting some of that sort of wider context together was, was important as well before getting into the, the central, you know, six week stint of the actual live in experiment. You know, where did that actually come from? How did they get to this point in the first place was, was interesting to me. That's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that, that sort of brings me on to, to a question I had, which is about the form of, of uh, the, both poems in the collection and, and the collection as a whole. Um, I mean, for me, there is a, there's, there is a kind of ebb to it that there's a kind of, and, and I think there's something visually going on with the way that the poems are set on the page that kind of brings in the water, the water tank and things like that. Um, so, I mean, and across, across the, the collection, um, that, that you're, you're playing with different types of forms, different uh, rhyme schemes and, th and things like this. And I know that form is something that you're particularly interested in. Um, I mean, could you, could you say something uh, about where, how, how you play with form and, and why you wanted to do it in that way? Yeah, I mean, as you say, it's, it's not just in, in this work, and I'm not sure there was a sort of specific formal agenda that I had in mind, other than wanting to explore a few different uh, you know, the range of forms in the book, I guess, just represents the range of things that were going on as much as anything and, and the desire to kind of keep it varied. Uh, but yeah, you can see, you know, in this first poem, some of the lines kind of move all around the page. Some of them are structured more like uh, just blocks of text, especially the, the more rhymed ones, the sonnets. There's a sort of parody of... Um, um, there's a sort of parody of stop all the clocks in here. I mean, a lot of it is just me goofing off, to be honest. Um, but in terms in terms of why why I'm using form at all, um, I think it just I'm one of these people who finds constraints on creativity can can be actually kind of energizing and, and make you think of things you wouldn't otherwise. You know, a rhyme might lead you to a, a turn of phrase you weren't otherwise going to do, or the fact that there's a sort of externally imposed framework for you to push against can, can generate some kind of interesting friction. I mean, you know, I've, I've always been in, interested in playing with it and I suppose it's partly that I'm very, you know, interested in music and that tends to use rhyme a lot more heavily than a lot of contemporary poetry. So I'm, I'm maybe drawing on that as well. Uh, to an extent, it's something I've always done and I've tried to be a bit more conscious of what I'm doing with it and why, because it's easy for formal poetry to kind of slide into being you know, conservative in other ways than, than just aesthetically. You, you've got to kind of look out for some of the um, some of the wider context of, of, of something like form and structure. Um, but yeah, I tend to think about it in academic terms a lot through um, the work of a writer called Caroline Levine um, and her book Forms, which came out in 2015, which thinks about form in the aesthetic sphere and form in the political or social sphere um, be, being sort of, Ideas that, that can actually over. Sorry, that's, no, that's just the wind. Let me start that again. Uh, Caroline Levine tends to think about form in the aesthetic sphere and, and form in political or social contexts be, being similar. So she talks about the ways universities are structured as being formal, the ways that you know uh, a prison or a school are, are run as, as being kind of formal um, institutions, I guess. And so she's interested in how the, the aesthetic and the political uses of form sort of bounce off each other and, and cause tension with each other. And I think that's increasingly what I've been looking to do as well. And that's very interesting. And you, I mean, you, you've, you work within those different forms poetically, but also, you know, professionally. Um, you're, you're, um, you're an academic researcher um, who looks at some of these questions. And you're also uh, the uh, poet laureate of Birmingham. Uh, not anymore. 
not you, okay yeah uh when when what what here with were you awarded that <laughs> title yeah, I, 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 I wasn't disgraced or anything it just uh the time ran out um it was 2018 <laughs> to 2020 and and the the post is usually now run on a on a two-year basis so the current the current uh laureate is casey bailey uh whose work you might have come across in the peaky blinders uh season five ad campaign um uh, so yeah it, it was in 2018 and um Sorry, I kind of lost track of what the question was. Oh, no, sorry. It was a, um, so, uh, well, I'd, it'd just be, I'm quite interested to hear a bit more about what the role involved, um, being sort of poet laureate of a, of a specific city, and Birmingham in this case. And Yeah, so I always understood the role as kind of a, an ambassador for poetry within the city, both to, to talk to people about why it was interesting to me to read it and why it might be of interest to them to read it and uh, and also to sort of get people writing their own uh their own poems um about things that were interesting to them and a lot of the work that i did was actually in collaboration with um sort of history and heritage organizations especially in the jewelry court so which is a part of birmingham where i used to live and it has this really interesting sort of traditional craft heritage which is being kept alive in the present day and obviously something about that kind of appeals to me based on all the stuff I've just been saying about poetry and form um but yeah so I, I did a lot of work um for organizations in that area sort of basically I guess translating some of the more interesting aspects of that history into sort of uh poetic packages that could be performed or or displayed um in the in those spaces uh, the most sort of uh, um the most recent and I think probably the highest profile thing that came out of that is that I've written a poem for the Warstone Lane Victorian Cemetery, which is going up on the interpretation panels when they reopen uh, that space, which has been sort of reworked over the last couple of years. I'm really excited about that. Mm. Oh, that's really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really interested in the way that the, the, the kind of social and cultural past, particularly specific, um, sometimes strange in the case of the, the kind of dolphin story and sometimes um, stories or, or spaces that are really uh, important to people's understanding of their own community um, and things like that and how, how poetry can press them forward and advertise them and advocate for them, I suppose. Um, and, and that seems like something that these laureateships uh, can, can help do for, for um, kind of placemaking, I suppose, is one word for it um, in communities. Yeah, you know, I was really conscious of the fact that I wanted to write about the the history of Birmingham, which is interesting and complex, but in a way that was sort of hopefully engaging for readers in the present day, because, you know, that is history that's all around them in the present day, all around me, where I was living, and um, thinking about the sort of continuities and discontinuities of experience there was, was really interesting to me. Um, I could read the poem from the, the cemetery if that would be of any use. It might give you an, an idea of what I'm actually talking about. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, so this is the poem that I wrote for the Warstone Lane Cemetery, which is called um, A Cliff, A Centre. And that's a line from um, a poem about, partly about the same space by uh, Roy Fisher, a really great poet who lived most of his life in Birmingham. A Cliff, A Centre. Perhaps past struck, a horse-drawn hearse has pulled you up the hill to hear. Or in some census, scanners smeared, his name, her job, fuzzy and terse. Or nothing as old or grand as grief, a sandwich to break up the day. Across the humming middle way, a dog's dim glimpse of green relief. Beneath, between death's mansions, starched and stout, lie graves crowded as hockley courts with setter's sons and jeweler's daughters. We live in flats, it gets us out. Absent a church, a birch tree breathes its blessing on the catacombs. Without a thought of grace or gloom, a squirrel skitters through the leaves. That's lovely. So, so yeah. Richard, are they, are they, um, uh, could, could you say a bit about how that's going to be um, put up in the cemetery? Did you say it'd be a plaque? Uh, yeah, it's sort of an interpretation board. So they're, they're redeveloping these two big Victorian cemetery spaces in the jewellery quarter and, um, I think there's going to be a sort of memorial stone put in, which quotes from some Victorian poets from Birmingham, people like uh, Constance Naden, who was actually buried there, um, among others. And uh, then near that, there's going to be uh, interpretation boards about the different ways people engage with the cemeteries today, which in some ways are 
quite different to that sort of Victorian ideal. And in other ways, they were intended as public spaces, they were intended as green spaces, so it's not completely dissimilar. Uh, and then the poem will be part of the, um, the boards uh, interpreting that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sounds, that sounds great. I wondered if, um, I mean, sort of moving on from this, this sense of how poetry, um, particularly public facing poetry, I suppose, speaks to people's, brings in both the past and speaks to cultural experiences today, um, in particular experiences that move across different types of media. Um, I wondered if, so one of the things that um, I, I sort of mentioned to you be uh, before we came on to do this chat, uh, is how your collection on the Dolphin House kind of reminded me of the idea of a concept album. And I know that you're, uh, well, a very big music fan, but in, um, and in particular that you're engaged with kind of writing about the musical past at the moment. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I mean, I might be way off, maybe it's nothing like the concept album. Uh, but yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how kind of contemporary pop and rock music, I suppose, uh, inform your work if they do. <laughs> yeah, well, so I, I guess what you're, <laughs> what you're talking about there is I, I've been doing for the last few weeks um, a Substack newsletter and podcast um, called Now Here We Are 30 Years Later, a memoir in Mountain Goat Songs. And what that is, it's, uh, it's um, essentially me sort of working through some autobiographical... Um, essentially what that is, is it's kind of telling the story of my life uh, from 1990 onwards through the lens of my favorite band who actually started playing music in around 1990, uh, an American indie rock band called the Mountain Goats. And so each year of the, the, the series is taking a year from my life and a song written or performed that year by the band. Um, and they have recorded quite a few concept albums about things like um, taking a lot of drugs in Portland in 1985, uh, to, to name just one, but also, um, goth music and uh, semi uh, goth music and um, minor league professional wrestlers, if that's the right, the right phrase. Um, and I guess the, the overlap there would be that um, I think a concept album, it, you know, is not completely unrelated to, a, a, sorry, I'm, I'm completely getting lost. I think a concept album has a lot in common with certain kinds of poetry collection in that it's a way of kind of defining your terms when you when you set out on, on a writing project. So you know that you're aiming to get, you know, certain themes kind of governing the work that you produce and, and sort of setting some limits on it as well. And um, as I say, I think it's probably just that I've been listening to music and especially music where I pay a lot of attention to the lyrics, uh, you know, pretty closely for at least, you know, half my life. And, um, you know, the, the songwriter of the Mountain Goats, John Daniel, is my favourite writer. Um, and it probably took me a while to kind of recognise it was OK to say that my favourite writer was a songwriter rather than a, a, a poet. He is now a novelist uh, as well. But... Um, you know, actually, that's probably the, the writing that's had the most impact on me in the way I think about form, the way I think about craft and things like that. And so, you know, the newsletter is to an extent exploring where my own kind of sensibilities and ideas about writing come from is, is partly through having spent half my life with this writer in it, mm -hmm. in this kind of weird intimacy that a person has with their favourite band and how that's actually shaped who I am as a writer, who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. I find that really fascinating, especially because, you know, I mean, things are a little different now, or hopefully they are in the way that poetry is taught and the way that people perhaps first encounter it. But there is the idea that poetry is a sort of higher, you know, sphere, that it might be difficult or that it always has to be difficult and challenging and perhaps that people feel they you know, they're, they're not going to go and sit down and read a poetry collection in the way they might listen to an album on Spotify. But in actual fact, you know, that these, I think in many cases, they're forced distinctions between art forms that are very that, that, that are in a kind of mutual exchange with each other and, and maybe you know yeah. when um, uh, Bob Dylan won the Nobel Prize for Literature not that many years ago this is a kind of recognition of a similar sort of thing to what you're talking about there Richard. Yeah it's, it's really interesting and I, I think I have some sort of complex feelings about the fact that that happened I mean I think there's a lot of writing by Dylan that's very good uh, and a lot that maybe isn't up to the, the level of his kind of best work and I don't know if a Nobel Prize has to be for a completely consistent body of work. I think if if the if Dylan winning the prize opened the door for that prize awarding 
for that prize being awarded to more songwriters and especially, uh, you know, a more diverse range of songwriters, that would be no bad thing. I think a lot of people think that it might have been a one-off to appease boomer dads, and that's not an inherent good. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how I feel about that. What I do remember is that on uh, one of the residential poetry courses that, that you and I are on together as, as teens, uh, one of our tutors, I think it was... Um, I think it was Daljit Nagra talked about the fact that you can't really compare Dylan and Keats, even if you think they're both really good writers, because they are just drawing on a different set of tools. Keats doesn't ever have a drumbeat. And so, you know, that, that is the, the way that music and phrasing and pauses and things like that shape our engagement with the lyricist words. I think we can't set that aside completely. We can't say that that's completely irrelevant because otherwise we would just read the words and not listen to the songs. Mm. So I do think they have to be understood as separate spheres, even though they, they inform each other, you know, at least in their kind of modern forms, you know, at, at root. Yes, they are very similar. That's, you know, why we use the word lyric. And, and John Daniel from the Run Goats talks about uh, what he's doing as being kind of grounded in oral tradition. It's very interesting in, you know, that he has a song about Beowulf, for example, Grendel's mother. So it's going back to that in a sense, but in a modern context, you know, poets and lyricists are sort of using some skills in common, but then drawing on some materials that the, the other doesn't have, each is drawing on material the other doesn't have access to. So it, it's slightly complicated. I guess it's more of a Venn diagram than a sort of um, complete overlap. Yes, yeah, well, that's very interesting. I mean, to take to take uh, this kind of conversation about media into uh, away from the audible and and to uh, back to the the Dolphin House collection, I'm quite interested in the the kind of visual appearance of it. So it's wonderfully printed, um, and, and I'll be personally quite keen to hear more about the press and the other presses that you that you work with. Um, and how, I guess, how involved you are in the visual layout of the work and, and whether, you, you know, that's important to, yeah, to, to the kind of... Yeah. Yeah, so The Dolphin House was um, released by Broken Sleep and it's actually the second um, um, publication of mine with them. They also have a sort of um, sub-imprint, I guess, for, for really limited run uh, micro-pamphlets called Legitimate Snack. And I had a pamphlet out in that series um, called these curse no it was called um i think it was called the pictures of my youth yes it was uh i had a, a, a pamphlet out on this smaller imprint called the pictures of my youth which essentially looked at mid-2000s internet shark images and and uh i knew in that series they were really invested in the typography the colors we were talking about getting a sort of neon you know early 90s sort of digital green um, you know cover effect and um sort of scrolling ones and zeros in the matrix type of thing and and similarly with the dolphin house you know i really wanted the sense of a kind of flickering um the the text that is, is in a sort of yellow with um some kind of degradation effect on it so it looks like a sort of flickering strip light and you've got the the water underneath that and all of this was stuff that me and Aaron Kent the publisher went back and forth about in quite a lot of detail he's very invested in in the the visual appearance of the books the thing that I was definitely very involved in was uh, I really wanted there to be a dolphin fleuron which is the sort of takes the place of an asterisk dividing sections of poems and, and, and sections of the whole book and uh, I did think it might be a little bit, bit kitsch but I also just really wanted it <laughs> so I um, I pressed for it and I guess the reason to talk about other presses the reason I was even aware of things like fleurons is um, for a while I was uh, commissioning editor um, at the Emma Press um, one of one of the team and um, we had some books that had individual fleurons so John Clegg had uh, a pamphlet with them Captain Love and the Five Joaquins that had um uh, I now can't remember what it was. They had, they had a fleur on uh, specifically reflecting some of the themes of that book. And um, it just seemed like a nice, fun way to sort of break up the text, I suppose. Um, because it's all one narrative, I, you know, I was looking for these ways to kind of divide it by section and things like that. Yeah, it, it sort of reminds me of, um, you know, one subsection of uh, study in the, the early printed book. Uh, and, and in particular, the book around the book as it, as it exists around kind of Shakespeare's period, is invested in these kind of questions of power texts, um, yeah. which would include the kind of visual layout of the page that aren't the words, um, and so yeah. it includes the fluorons. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's just yeah, my absolute favourite early modern paratextual feature. 
there's in um, Thomas Nash's pamphlet, Have With You to Saffron Walden, where he's basically just getting in a, a long and, and very abstruse war of words with another writer called Gabriel Harvey. There's a, a square, a sort of bordered square, where after there's a bunch of insults that Nash himself has leveled at Harvey, he leaves a blank space for the reader to fill in their own insults. <laughs> As part of me that's always wanted to get just that blank space to toot on my arm. <laughs> Yeah, that is great. <laughs> like 400 years later, you can just add in, like, Andy's a prick. <laughs> yeah, it's a convenient way of avoiding, like, libel laws these days, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, that was excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, you said a little bit, uh, we're talking about the Mountain Goats newsletter, um, the, the, the memoir uh, that, you're, that you're sending out uh, via email. Um, but I wondered if you might say uh, a word or two more about what it is that you're doing now and what kind of future projects you have in store. Yes, certainly. So uh, once I climb out from under the, the mountain of marking uh, that's currently on my, my desk, um, I'd really like to get back to a novel I've been working on. So I've been trying to write um, a sort of... Uh, in a way, it's a coming-of-age novel. It's set in in France in, in 2010, in, in Nantes, in the west of France, which is where I spent some time on my year abroad. And it's kind of drawing on some of those experiences, but through uh, a sort of fantastic filter, um, in, in, and I, uh, fantastic in the, in the literary sense rather than as a term of praise. Um, so the main character is, is going through this experience of living in France as an English language assistant surrounded by other English speakers doing the same and not really spending a lot of time with other French people. And it's a sort of weird, small, you know, isolated community uh, in which so the sort of things happen that don't when you have more friends. Um, but in the novel, there's a, a wholly uh, different element, which is that a mermaid starts speaking to the main character from the river and sort of shaping his decisions through the rest of the plot. And um, it's been quite fun for me kind of taking some experiences which are real and kind of running them through something which is very, very unreal and, uh, and and seeing the way that that kind of magical element sort of transforms the narrative of the text. So that's something I really want to get back into in the summer. Well, that sounds great. I mean, that kind of surrealism is is present in what we started talking about in the kind of Dolphin House collection too, I think. Um, certainly. Yeah. The book is tentatively called Immersion, which is a word that also appears in Dolphin House. And it, it is drawing on something similar about kind of the border between land and water and, you know, whether things are different in another element, I suppose. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, we've, we, we've sort of coming out that we've talked a little bit in terms of music and um, a visual form and, and those kind of questions. Um, and I wondered if we might um, round out with the awful topic that we pose <laughs> to almost all of our contributors about uh, the, the idea of literature itself. Um, yeah, I, d I mean, you know, I, d I don't want to uh, set limits on, on the terms of the question. I just wondered if you had thoughts on how useful that term is and what it might mean. Yeah, I, I'm fine with the term. I suppose there is uh, something to discuss about the ways it, it sort of excludes as well if you think about literary fiction versus genre fiction and whether or not literary fiction should actually just be viewed as, as its own genre. I mean, that that's certainly a, a valid question. But in terms of, you know, what is literature or, or sort of what is literature for? I mean, obviously, as, as someone who teaches both the reading and writing of, of books, I, I feel like I have to think about that. And I'm not sure I'm any closer to having an answer than anyone else is. Um, when I was at school, I remember seeing uh, a quote on the wall of my English teacher's classroom from Alan Bennett's play, The History Boys. And it, it's a famous quote about reading and feeling like a hand has come out and taken yours, even from someone, you know, hundreds of years in the past. You know, there, there's a sort of potentially a sentimentality to that, but I also think there's something very valid about the idea of reading and seeing something that either shows you something you recognize about yourself or even better, actually helps you understand something about yourself you didn't previously in a new way. And I think, you know, I would have liked a few years ago maybe to think that literature helps us understand the world, understand the society in, in some broad way. I'm not sure it does that in a way that actually leads to any social change um, or, or, or in a way that's sort of un, unproblematic, uh, you know, the idea of literature shaping politics or anything like that. But I do think literature can help individuals understand themselves better. And I do think ultimately for a lot of people that that's a useful and, and a sort of healthy thing to be doing. Mm. I'm not sure I have more than that, but I think maybe, maybe that's enough if it just helps you live. 
yeah absolutely yeah um yeah thanks richard that's that's really fast this has been a, a really interesting conversation uh, i'm looking forward to the forthcoming work and projects evolving um did, was there anything else that you wanted to um bring up before we say goodbye no, I mean, was there anything I should try and explain more clearly? I feel like I talked myself into some loops back there. Oh, I don't think so. We can we can um, stop the recording and then uh, yeah yeah and then I'll uh, well I'll do it now. We don't have to have a, a sign off. Um,